let's get into uh, what I think some people are probably excited about, which is the Chappelle special. Uh, I got to watch it last night. Here, here's, here's the deal. As a comic, usually, like, trying to do breakdowns and critiques of other comics' material is weird. And I kind of don't want to... I don't know. I, I am going to kind of do that a little bit. But I'm not saying that it's, like, good or bad. The special is good. I like the special a lot. My personal opinion, it, that... Out of the five Dave Chappelle specials that are on Netflix, that special is the best one. Sticks and Stones is is the best special that he has put out. And I think it's because um, he took his time with it, and what he's addressing is very prevalent to the, to the current sociopolitical climate and the zeitgeist that we're living in. I think it's a good special. Um... I think a lot of fucking people missed the point. <laughs> that's this. Like, there's a whole bunch of reviews about it that's like, he's still transphobic. And he says the N-word. And, he, and he's a, he's mean and he's bad. Like, that's the whole, there's all the reviews about it. It's like, if you like Dave Chappelle, then you're bad. Like, that's, the, that's all of the reviews. Like, a bunch of people... That, like, non artisty people are, like, that's kind of what they're saying. And it misses the fucking point, because that's the fucking point of the special. <laughs> uh, but I want to run through a couple of the things that he talks about. He opens the special really, really interestingly. You know, it is not um, him coming out on stage to a roaring crowd like, you're, like we're used to with other specials. It's him kind of already on stage singing a Prince song. And it's so, that was so interesting to me. I was like, this is kind of like a real mellow way of starting a special. And it's interesting because it's like, I don't think anybody else can fucking do that. Like that is, I feel like that is a very Dave Chappelle thing to do. Um, it fits his personality a whole lot. And oh, by the way, I should also say before we keep going, there are going to be spoilers to the special. I'm not going to, like, do his jokes, but I am going to talk about the things that he addresses in the special. Um, and I might kind of delve into some of the premises and, like, the mechanics of the joke and shit like that. I have an academic mind. What, what do you... I, like, that's just... That's fucking who I am. You know? Like, if you've ever come to see me do stand-up, and my stand-up has a very academic bend to it, and that's just who I am. I, I like over... I, I like analyzing shit. I like the academic perspective of things. Um, I think everybody, like, knowledge is meant to be shared, and that's just my perspective. That's who I am. So, so spoiler alert. If you're going to continue, maybe skip the next, you know, 20, 25 minutes of the video uh, or less. I don't, I don't know how long it's going to be, but, uh, I got my, I got these notes that I'm trying to get through with this. So, uh, spoilers. But he does open up with, um, with a joke about Anthony Bourdain. And he goes, Anthony Bourdain killed himself. <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, that guy had the best job in the world. And he still, like, hung himself in a fucking hotel in France. Uh, and then he sings the Prince verse and he goes into the next bit about this guy that he knew was the smartest dude, got out of the ghetto, you know, like, went to law school, got married, and then got a divorce while he was still in law school. The woman took half of the nothing that he had, and then he went through the rest of his life being influenced by this divorce, and he manages a, a, a footlocker now, and, you know, Dave and him had drinks, and they, and he was like, yeah, I've been living with my mom, trying to get out of this hole for the last 10 years, and, and the punchline to that joke is, and this... This guy never thought about killing himself once. Like that's not even an option on the table. Uh, and and I and that that is an important joke. Like what a phenomenal way to kick off a special. Um, like this dude, it like Anthony Bourdain had it all, but his inner demons were always still there. And this dude's inner demons are his outer demons. And I'm probably sure, I'm sure this guy has, but but like life has kind of kicked this dude. A bunch and he's still like yeah I gotta keep trying you know and that's very it's a very interesting dichotomy that he presents at the top of the special 
And it's a beautiful dynamic that he presents at the top of the special. And it, and it kind of is the overarching theme of the rest of the show. Because he basically then goes on to make fun of the audience for, for being like, I love you and I think you're great, and I, but if you did something bad, then I'm going to fucking cancel you. I'm going to come after you and make sure everybody knows that you're bad. Everybody knows that you're going to be fucking done. And he's like, that's you. That's the audience. And that's the culture we're living in. Where everything is under a fucking microscope. That if you don't say something perfectly, if you don't, if you don't, um, like this cancel culture that we're living in, where, where if it's not, uh, you know, perfectly aligned with everything that you believe in the exact perfect way, then they're going to dig deep and try to ruin your whole fucking life and cancel all your shit. And it's a terrible way to run a society. I mean... It's just, a, it's just an extension of running a society ruled by fear. And he's like, yeah, it's a dangerous point to be a celebrity. And he basically, at that point, he basically goes, I am going to offend you. That is sort of what, that is sort of the way that he opens up to special. Is like, I'm going to say shit that is not PC. That is not going to perfectly line up with the liberal leftist agenda. And it's not going to perfectly line up with the conservative right-minded agenda. It is it is, it is an, a, a non-agenda base. It is my perspective and my view. And that's it. And it's not going to be perfect. And it's going to be dirty and messy, but that's the point of it. And he does all of that in that one perfect little imp- impression and why he does that impression. It was really well... It, it, what a f- like great first 10 minutes of a special. I was very impressed. And then he kind of talks about celebrity culture. And he kind of he kind of hammers out a bunch of different celebrities that got in trouble for a bunch of sociopolitical issues that they got entangled in. You know, like Michael Jackson, and he and he has his own spin to to, to the Michael Jackson situation and and the victims of uh, Michael. He like satirically claim, he says that he's a victim blamer in the special. Uh, but it, but it's satire. It's overplaying that sort of stuff. It's hyperbole. He's making fun of himself and the people that kind of claim, you know, like that that espouse to that belief and are proud of being that sort of stuff. It's it's satire. I will say the one thing that uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of like art forms and stuff within the Trump administration, like satire has been beaten to hell. People just don't understand what satire is anymore. Right, like how you can use that to 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 present truth to power, to present what a uh, power structure is doing, fucking sucks. And Trump wasn't the one that did that shit, by the way. Trump's not the one that destroyed it. It's the people that ended up with that Trump derangement syndrome. That it's just like the orange man did everything badly, and he's the one that caused all of it. Everything was perfect. Like that, that whole mentality, like that Trump derangement syndrome, is what ended up killing satire. Not Trump himself. You know, there have been plenty of presidents that, when you make fun of their administration or make fun of the power structure that they belong to, have fought back, or will try to smear the people fighting back against them, or whatever it is. He's not the first one to do it. Anyway. Uh, he hits on a bunch of different stuff, like Kevin Hart's tweets. He talks about Kevin Hart's tweets. Uh, and he kind of breaks down the absurdity of what Kevin Hart tweeted. And he does it in a really, really... Like, he just it's just absurd. Like, he breaks down the tweets of, like, what that... What, that, what, what it would have meant to literally do what he did. I mean, my thoughts on Kevin Hart was he fucked up. He fucked up 10 years ago. And he never thought he'd have to address it because it was 10 years ago. I doubt he even fucking remembered that he did that sort of shit 10 years ago. So that pops up again. And he did apologize at one point, And then the Oscars were like, apologize again. Uh, and then Dave Chappelle's like, he said no. And he left. And then he went on a six-week apology tour on every single TV show. <laughs> To, like, make date a celebrity, essentially, is sort of what the dig against him was. But, I, you know, Kevin Hart's, like, this incredibly positive person now that's, like, I fucked up, I've done bad things, I'm trying to do better, I'm trying to, like, 
I'm trying to have a positive spin to my name. Like he did a whole his his Joe Rogan interview is is very interesting and poignant and like um yeah, that dude I think just wants to like do something good with the name that he has because you know, uh, I think he has he has a, uh, a sketchy past and uh, issues with his dad, and that that kind of got reconciled. But like, he just wants the name to have some kind of positive um, positive connotation, uh, and I think he's working hard at it. Now, um, he does address Ke- uh, Doc Kevin Hart. Dave Chappelle in the special talks about using the word faggot and. Um, I know a lot of people don't like that word. I'm not a huge fan of the word either, but I have gotten, I have been called that word so many times in my comedy career uh, by by some audience members and by other comics. Uh, so like I've used it in jokes before. Um, it, I, like I have a whole, I used to do a whole thing about why I don't like the word faggot because there, it's just not like a good, like it doesn't, have a good connotation there's no positive connotations to that word and I would say it a whole bunch and people got very offended about it um, and I was just like I have been called this word so many fucking times like this is my way of basically like pushing back against it to be like yeah it's a shit word dude like and I get what you're trying to do but that word I'm not gonna let you have this power over me with that word kind of a thing uh, but Basically, the story that he tells is about standards and practices um, on the Chappelle show and him using the N-word. And uh, and they were like, well, you're not, you know, you're not gay, so you can't use that word. And he, you know, he was like, okay, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes, well, why do you guys have a word, a problem with me using this word, but not with the N-word? And he was like, well, Dave because you know you're you're black and he was like yeah i'm black but i'm not an n-word and it that is such a powerful moment in the show like it's such a powerful moment in the show and then it also tells you a whole lot about how dave Chappelle views that word even though he says that word a lot on stage but he views that word as i I'm making a little bit of a conjecture based on the joke, but I, I would I would say he views that word as a um, as a pushback to the people that have weaponized the word, right? Um, but he doesn't define himself by it, and that and that's an important distinction to make. And he does that in that joke, and it's a fucking great, great joke. It's an awesome joke. And uh, and then he goes into the LGBTQ community. Um, and, you know, he talks about angering the alphabet people. Uh, and and he's like, I can't stop talking about the T's. They came after me and I can't stop writing these jokes. And he does it fucking brilliantly. Um, now, there's a comedian by the name of Owen Benjamin. Uh, some of you might remember Owen Benjamin. Uh, I, I have not heard a peep from him in like a year and a half. I don't even know what the fuck he's doing. But Owen Benjamin used to have a joke, uh, or, or he tried to do this joke, where he broke it down by letters, and he and a lot of it was like base level jokes about like very base level stereotype jokes about the gay community, um, where and he basically ended it with like the T's are fucking it up for everybody because they're asking for too much. That was sort of the premise of the joke. Uh, Oh, Benjamin is a very conservative comedian, uh, to say the least. Uh, And he's sort of a very controversial figure. He said some fucked up things. Here's the thing. Owen Benjamin, not really that great of a comedian. Like, I watched that bit, and I I was, like, watching him try to do... Like, I got what he was trying to do, but it just... he, He never hit the mark with it. Because it's just not his style. Like, he's stepping way out of his comfort zone. He, he A lot of his jokes are, like, low-hanging fruit, you know, reinforcing stereotypes, like, old 80s-style comedy. Shit that people wanted me to do when I used to work clubs. It's like, why don't you just do the stereotype stuff and do what people want expect from an Indian comedian? Like, shit like that. 
it, that's sort of what Owen Benjamin does. But he had this thing where he broke, uh, you know, the the, uh, the LGBTQ letters. And Dave Chappelle does the the premise, and he kind of does it way fucking better. And he addresses it with all of this like empathy because he talks about the trans community, and you know, he talks about like having empathy because to to wake up in a different body than than what you know you belong in is you know he says it's hilarious but it's also a difficult thing right like that i i can't imagine like psychologically what what that does I, i've talked i've talked to my trans friends about it but i i cannot physically experience something like that uh any any the way that he kind of does talks about that is he kind of goes into a little bit of a racist joke but it's justified in terms of like what if he was Chinese on the inside but he bro- woke up in, in you know the black body that he has and it was like okay <laughs> I see what you're doing and he does like a, a Chinese accent and I was like oh I get and then you know he addresses the fact he's like why are you doing that and he's like because this is how I think I'm supposed to sound to help make you understand what it is so I was like, ah, I get the justification behind it. It's it's not my favorite joke, but once you hear the justification, I also didn't, like, hate it all that much. Um, and then he addresses it later in the show that his wife, who is, all, who is uh, also of Asian descent, does not particularly care for the joke. Um, so, uh, yeah, man, he just fucking outdid Owen Benjamin's very terrible execution of, of a very similar premise. Uh, and I thought he did a great job with it. And I thought, he, you know, he he kind of he kind of gave an outsider perspective of, of of the LGBTQ community in a very understanding way. I think uh, he's still crass about it. That's what Dave Chappelle is. Dave Chappelle is snarky, sarcastic, and and satiric, and but he's also crass, and that's what you got to expect from his comedy. Um, talks about Louis C.K. and and the way he addresses the abortion debate, you know, he kind of slams the states for for their stringent anti-abortion bills. Uh, And and I think he takes a little bit more of a serious turn at this point in the show uh, after he kind of calls out the Me Too movement for for going about the way that they went about things. Uh, And that was sort of the you know, I kind of had a similar idea as well in terms of like, look, I get it. I understand what it was with Louie and everything, but like the big culprit is people like Harvey Weinstein and the people that, um, you know, get away with larger sexual assault crimes um, and how the justice system is involved in all of that. That, and I think the B2 movement could push back a lot harder against it. But what, what kind of became the pop culture aspect of the B2 movement is the obsession with what celebrities were doing and how to call out celebrities because I think it was a top-down kind of thing. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't know if that particularly works, right? Like, And he called out Joe Biden where he was just like, yeah, Trump's, Trump's still grabbing pussies and nobody gives a shit, but Joe Biden can't get, get away with smelling kids' hair. Like, the Democratic Party doesn't have anything. The left doesn't have that kind of uh, bravado in itself to, to do something like that. That's why it's like you've got to figure out a different way to make people give a shit about this sort of stuff. Um, and it, and, it's, and it's an, I think it's an important point. It's a controversial point, but it's an important point, that it, and he made the distinction to it. Uh, and then he starts digging into the opioid crisis. Kind of did a little bit of an obvious joke. Uh, mildly obvious joke for the for the opioid crisis with uh, with the heroin addict that jumped out of the dumpster in Dayton and she said five dollars to suck your dick and he goes T- uh, two you know a little bit of an obvious joke but the rest of it he ties the opioid crisis in with the uh, with the gun debate and why he wants to own a gun because the poor whites are addicted to heroin they're addicted to a bunch of other stuff uh, and he weaves this story uh, this this scenario. And to me, it read a, like the the execution of it. It's a very different bit. Uh, 
Uh, but the execution of it was similar to what Bill Burr did in um, in one of his specials when he talked about guns. There, I think there's like two or three specials where Bill Burr has just talked about guns. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And he, and he starts talking about like the poor whites, the poor whites. He starts talking about the poor whites. Uh, and he satirically start, starts talking about like they're stealing a dollar fifty from him, and he's still going to be protective of that dollar fifty, even though, you know, he just five minutes earlier in the bit he talks about having a twelve thousand dollar suit. So, it, it's this level of satire of like even rich people are going to protect a dollar fifty because that's how much money means to them, and it's done in this very hyper subtle way um, that I don't know if most people caught it, uh, but I got a weird break. Um, and kind of goes into Jesse <laughs> French French actor Jesse Smollett is what he calls him Jesse Smollett. Uh, I don't. I he might have not been able to talk about. Him. Like he might have not been able to say his name or something. Uh, I don't know, but it was kind of funny that he just kept calling him Jesse Smollett. Uh, and that whole controversy, like he called it out, was just like, yeah, this guy's lying. Because it was just so cartoonishly racist. Uh, like, the the rope and the bleach. Like, whenever people found out that it was a lie, it was like, this is why people don't believe hate crimes. You know? It, it's because of people like Jesse Sommelier that fucking make a travesty out of it. That lie to keep their fucking name in the media. To make themselves, like, more fucking culturally relevant uh and it sucks but it's also like what a fucking shitty thing to do like you made this so cartoonishly racist and now like real legitimate hate crimes that do happen across the country that get reported because of this asshole might not be taken seriously (laughs) so i it was kind of cool that this guy fucking called him out uh and uh and and he went into uh Went into uh, the the uh, the poverty closer where he talks about growing up poor, um, and he addresses like, "Look, I make fun of you because I see myself in you, and that's that's why I make fun of these minority communities is not to put them down, but to help." I, I don't know. I, I, it was strange because it was like it's it's to talk about it to to kind of shed light on it, to normalize it, to to make things you know like. It's cool. Like, we can... We can bust each other's balls about these sort of things. Um, and he did it without... Without being too low-hanging fruit about it. But he goes into the epilogue... Uh, where he was on Broadway... Uh, and... Uh, and he told a couple stories... And there was, like, some really good comedy advice in there... Where he was just like, you should just do it. If you if you're thinking about doing comedy, just do it. And it was kind of cool. It was really really fucking cool to see that 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 a guy of his stature is still doing that. Uh, then he talked about hanging out with Chris Tucker and Kamala Harris, uh, DA Kamala Harris, not Senator slash candidate Kamala Harris. Uh, and I, and there was like a weird, strange like half-hearted smattering of applause that was like yeah nobody fucking cares about her anymore and I was like I hope you don't I hope I hope Dave Chappelle is smart enough to like not vote for Kamala Harris or or like support Kamala Harris in any way because she kind of sucks and kind of fucked over his community a whole bunch like she's an awful person candidate she's just shitty uh, the epilogue was very good. He had some really good jokes. He had some really good breakdowns and um, addressed a lot of things. Like, he, like at one point, he was just like, Trump's, Trump's not even the problem. Trump is basically the symptom of a disease. He's the product of a system that's been uh, exploiting poor people and the working class for a very long time. So that's kind of what, what uh, brings me to the closing of this segment. Um, this is what people missed out of this special. The special is about cancel culture. 
and the obsession with celebrity, right? It's, because the cancel culture and the obsession with celebrity kind of go hand in hand. They're, they're one and the same. People want to cancel celebrities that they have done, uh, think have done wrong, and, and some of these things are, are kind of minor, right? Like having ridiculous, over-the-top, homophobic tweets 10 years ago that you came out and apologized for, um, we're still going to bring those up and, and say that you're still a bad person forever making these tweets. You know, this obsession with needing to be perfect. And this obsession that celebrities need to be perfect. And if they're not, it's such a betrayal to, to people that they freak the fuck out and have to get these people canceled. And while we're doing that, and we're arguing about all of this, like, like he makes a comparison between MJ and R. Kelly. What R. Kelly did is the big story of, like, somebody exploiting children um, and provably doing it and, and how much of the record industry was just behind covering all that shit up. And then he addresses a lot about poverty through the opioid crisis and the gun debate and how even the argument of poverty addresses uh, the LGBTQ community. And that was sort of the underlying thing is that we missed the point we're so obsessed with celebrity and wanting them to be perfect and when they're not we feel betrayed so we have to like go after them and shut them down and ruin their lives that we miss the bigger picture that there are systems in place that continue the cycle of poverty and people hurting each other on the ground level and he did and he kind of wove it and i think the message is pretty subtle throughout the whole thing until you get right to the end and he talks about um growing up poor and having a lot of really great callbacks into the special. And at that moment is when you realize, like, that's what the special has been about. Anthony Bourdain killed himself, and he had one of the best lives that you possibly could. But his friend that got out of the ghetto and got his life, uh, law, law degree and had all this stuff promised in front of him is working at a Foot Locker at age 45. And he has not thought about killing himself. He is stuck in that poverty, but he's still fighting against it. And even though we have all these problems, the important aspect is that we need to be like that guy and realize that we can fight back against a system that is constantly keeping us down. And even if you ascertain all of this wealth, this obsession with celebrity we have, you don't know what's going on inside you, the, the brain of that person. You know, they could be, they could need just as much help as you do in a different way. Maybe not financially, but in a, a support kind of way. And he wove it very well. And every kind of, every piece kind of has its own importance that came together in that closer. It's a really good special. Everybody that's kind of against it is, I think, missing the point. I think they really missed what that special is really about. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I've been a fan of Dave Chappelle. I've been pretty critical of some of his stuff. Um, but look, if you're not a fan of, uh, one, addressing real issues, because I, I think he addresses real issues, uh, he kind of does it in a different way than, uh, than a lot of other comics. Because there's a lot of comics that are addressing real issues, right? Because people are now going to keep talking about Dave Chappelle. And I saw a lot of people post, like, he addresses this thing and this thing, and I just wrote it this kind of joke. Uh, Stuart Huff is an incredible comedian that not enough people know about, that, that has uh, addressed a variety of very important issues. Tom Simmons, another incredible comedian. Uh, Lee Camp, somebody that I work with, uh, I've worked with and I've opened for, addresses a ton of important shit in comedy. You know, George Collin, Bill Hicks, those are, those are the predecessors. These are people that are really, really important as well as Dave Chappelle. What Dave Chappelle is doing it is using that obsession with celebrity and using what his celebrity is to shine a light to say your obsession with me and the fact that I might make a crass joke uh, or use the word bitch or the n-word or whatever it is is missing the point. Um, and I think, he, I think it needed to be a celebrity to criticize celebrity culture, right? Like like attack it from within kind of a thing uh and i hope i hope enough people kind of got that message 
because I think there's a lot of very important things that we need to uh, fight about and you know I don't know if our obsession with celebrity is more important than that. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like and share it. Uh, these are little clips from a little segment I do called Road Reflections where uh, I go live on my Facebook page uh, and talk about current events, creativity, uh, touring, what's going on uh, in my life. So if you enjoy this kind of content, you can go and like my Facebook page and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Krish Mohan. Ha ha. Uh, I'm also performing live stand-up comedy all around the country. If you enjoyed these uh, little snippets of sociopolitical commentary, uh, it's very similar to what my stand-up comedy is. You can go to ramennoodlescomedy.com for all of the show dates and tickets. It's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. Uh, and if you want to continue supporting DIY independent socially conscious comedy content, you can become a patron today. I don't have uh, any corporate sponsors or any small business sponsors just yet. So at the moment, I am people sponsored. I'm sponsored by you guys. So you can go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha and become a patron today starting at only $2 a month. You can check out all the tiers and rewards. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you soon.